Hello cave dwellers, it's Atari Lynx time again in the cave today, and it's all thanks to Dragonbox.de. If you followed my recent Lynx refurbishment video, you'll remember I spoke about an upgrade to the LCD screen, and thanks to Dragonbox, we have one today and I'm very pleased to be able to demonstrate it to you. Or at least I will be, if everything goes to plan. Dragonbox are a German company headed up by this chap, surrounded by retro delights. And while this catalogue is in German, their website is completely in English and they do ship internationally. And they sell such things as retro handheld consoles, multi-system retro consoles, Raspberry Pi components and parts, SD card readers for retro systems, spare parts, cables, everything you could want really under one retro roof. So do check them out, dragonbox.de. But most importantly, they also supply the Atari Lynx McWill modded screen. That's an upgraded LCD screen available in both Atari Lynx 1 and Atari Lynx 2 variants. We have the Model 1 screen here, and well, what are we waiting for? Let's get this thing fitted. So why would we want to perform this modification? Well, let's be honest, you only have to take one look at an Atari Lynx screen and then glance at your phone or any LCD screen for that matter built in the last 20 years to realise what gains could be achieved. The Atari Lynx screen behaves the way it does because it's based on passive matrix addressing technology, an addressing scheme commonly used in early LCDs in which the pixels on their screen maintain their state passively. That is to say, each pixel is controlled by the intersection of two wires in a grid, if you alter the electrical charge at an intersection, the corresponding pixel is changed. We can see that this technology is not ideal for fast moving gameplay, but it's still very much in use today when combined with bi-stable technology. Something that's bi-stable can be rested in one of two states, so the pixel could be set, and then even when power's lost, it could remain in the state that it was left in. And so the combination of the very cheap to build passive matrix grid behind the screen and by stability, meaning whatever's on the screen will remain on the screen with little or no power, we have all of the ingredients for e-paper, which of course has found its purpose in e-reader devices. Great for books, but not for left hooks in Double Dragon on our Atari Lynx. So that's the old screen, but what are we upgrading to? Our new screen then is built to the correct dimensions to swap into our Atari Lynx, and this is an active matrix display. Instead of the passive grid system then, we have a thin film of transistors, or TFT, as well as capacitors per pixel. Instead of the slow method of charging wires to change pixels, this active method of simply addressing the corresponding capacitor is far faster and far brighter, and it should avoid all traces of ghosting if it switches quickly enough. It's also backlit, so we save power by not having to light a fluorescent light behind the old LCD. And it's for all of these advantages why the active display is used in modern handhelds, as well as televisions and anything with a fast moving image on it. The kit also comes with a VGA output port, which would be really useful for video capture. I'm not installing it today because I want to look at ways of making a discrete internal connector rather than cutting a hole in the case. So let's pop our links in the PCB holder and get started on the modification. It's worth noting at this point that Dragonbox offer a service by which you can send them your links and they'll perform this modification for you. But I'd like to show you just how involved performing the mod is so you can decide for yourself which is the best option for you. Instructions come in the form of a double-sided piece of A4, and they've squeezed a lot of information in there, but let's run you through what needs to be done. We begin by removing the components that are no longer needed for the upgraded screen. The first component is the power module. Now I chose to snip it off, you may have better success than me at desoldering it, but this one was particularly stubborn, and we need to be careful because we reuse these points to get power to the new screen. In particular, where it's labelled 1, that's our 5V VCC, and 2 is our ground. Next up we had a resistor R73 to deal with. This is surface mounted and I took care of it with a little extra solder to get the heat flowing through it. And then with not too much resistance for a resistor, we got it off of the board. And then we gave it a clean up with some braid just to leave it in a good state and moved on to Q9, a transistor which also needed to be removed. Again, this didn't cause too much trouble.
A little more fiddly, however, was resistor R34. To gain access to this, we had to remove the dial here from the board. And to add some drama to proceedings, here's a slow motion shot of R34 making a break for freedom as it's liberated from the board. Look at him go, Godspeed R34. Reunited with his comrades. We're then required to bridge the pads on R34. And we can move on to the removal of the LCD screen. Now we want to take particular care when removing the LCD screen because we need to reuse the connections under this ribbon cable and it's quite firmly glued into place. I chose to heat the glue to make removal a little easier. Well that went quite well and that means the screen is reusable. I did however get a little bit lucky because I meant to remove this secondary cable next and it came away of its own accord. That could just have easily have snapped. So do pay more attention than I am if you're attempting this yourself. The old backlight and associated fuses play no part in our new screen. So let's get those removed now. We can now start to fit the new screen and we use a ribbon cable to connect it to the links board. It can be a floppy cable, an IDE cable or similar like I'm using here. I stripped and tinned the ends of the cables ready for connection. If you thought this screen was a straight swap out, well I hope you're getting the full picture now, there's no going back at this point. I then followed the instructions extremely closely to make sure every wire was in the right place. But by far the most important instruction here is to exercise patience. This takes time and you can't rush it. And thank goodness we don't have to use every single one of those old connectors. Very few in fact, less than 10 to get this screen connected up, with additional cables out for the 5 volts and the ground, which all connect up to the pads conveniently located on the front of the new screen. And with the final cables in place, checked and double checked, let's try a power on test and see what happens. Oh and one last thing, I've grounded pin 1 on the back of the screen here, which should be done if you're not using the VGA output. It disables the options for that output on the screen, more on that shortly. And so I put power through the device, and by some miracle it worked first time. My first impression? Honestly, gobsmacked. Even with the screen protector on, the improvement is really quite astonishing. Well see for yourself, it's brighter, it's smoother, it's crisp, it's clean. The purists may even say it's too crisp and clean. And that's okay, there's a feature built right into the screen. The brightness dial no longer affects the brightness, it performs several functions. Turn it all the way to the left and scan lines are added to the screen to make it more authentic to the original screen. And if the VGA port was connected we would have extra functions on this dial to tell the output to go off down that port. Anyway, let's compare the screen to before the modification was made. How does that look? I think it's fair to say we have a clear winner. Before that screen was washed out and sprites were difficult to follow, particularly in fast moving games. I'd go so far as to say Shadow of the Beast was unplayable on the old screen and now it's just difficult and that difficulty isn't caused by the screen, it's the game itself. Another comparison now and most interestingly with this is the viewing angle. The viewing angle on the new screen is infinitely better than the old one. Take a look. 
In conclusion then, was this a worthwhile upgrade for our Atari Lynx? For me, absolutely yes, because I'm going to be using this a lot. And it feels not just like a mod or an upgrade, but like I'm finally experiencing the games on the Lynx, the way the developers intended them to be enjoyed. A major flaw of the Lynx was perhaps that it tried to reach too far too soon. And the weakest link in the Lynx's chain was always the screen. Now that's changed, the system really does shine. And our Lynx goes one step beyond trash, beyond treasure, it becomes the realisation of the machine it always should have been. As always, if you enjoy this content, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and come back soon. If you'd like to support more content, then why not join the list of patrons scrolling down the screen now who make this channel possible. Links can be found in the description and do let me know your Atari Lynx experiences in the comments section. Thanks for watching, take care.